terrorists attacked the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. Just before 9 a.m. New York time, that's 3 in the morning here in Hawaii, American Flight 11 crashed into one of the twin towers at the World Trade Center. The hijacked Boeing 767 had taken off from Boston less than an hour earlier on its way to Los Angeles. Then, 18 minutes later, captured by network and home video cameras alike, a second hijacked plane, this one a United flight, also from Boston to Los Angeles, crashed into the second tower. There was an enormous fireball, there was fire, debris falling to the ground, and then just a whole kind of mushroom of smoke that sort of just billowed up. It was like a blizzard, but a blizzard that wasn't cold, a blizzard that you know, had no wind, it was just hot. The twin towers of the World Trade Center, symbols of America's economic power, stood wounded in the morning sky. Then, an attack on the symbol of America's military power. A third plane, hijacked after takeoff from Dulles Airport in Washington, D.C., crashed into the Pentagon. It came streaking down and hit, and it hit short. Just, it didn't go into the top of the Pentagon. It came like in short, and then it, it, everything sprayed up, like a fireball sprayed up on the wall. Engulfed in flames and smoke, part of the Pentagon collapsed, and casualties there are expected to be in the hundreds. Back in New York, an hour after the first attack, thousands watched from the streets as the South Tower of the World Trade Center collapsed. Twenty minutes later, the second tower came down. Some 50,000 people work in those two towers at any given time. Evacuations began immediately after the first crash, and many were able to get out. But thousands are feared dead. Many of them police officers and firefighters who were in the towers responding to the injured and assisting in the evacuation. On the streets of Lower Manhattan, it was mayhem. At local hospitals, the wounded started to pour in. A makeshift morgue was set up on the Hudson River Pier. Just as the towers were falling, yet another hijacked plane, a United Airlines flight from Newark to San Francisco, crashed in western Pennsylvania. That plane was believed to be on its way to attack Camp David. Government sources say that on the American flight that crashed in New York, a flight attendant called the operations center saying that two flight attendants were stabbed and that the assailants had broken into the flight deck. Casualties uh, at the World Trade Center and the Pentagon are just speculation at this point, the numbers anyway. We do have one firm number, and that's a total of 266 passengers and crew killed in the four plane crashes. Now, we have some new video that we want to show you, home video, of the first plane crash into the first tower of the World Trade Center. This just came across from CNN, we are told. And there you can see the plane flying right into the middle of the upper part. That's the first plane into the first tower at the World Trade Center. President Bush was in Florida at the time of the attacks. He arrived in Washington about 6 p.m. Washington time. Two and a half hours later, he addressed the nation, vowing to find those who were responsible for what he called evil, despicable acts of terror. These acts of mass murder were intended to frighten our nation into chaos and retreat. But they have failed. Our country is strong. A great people has been moved to defend a great nation. Terrorist attacks can shake the foundations of our biggest buildings, but they cannot touch the foundation of America. The president says the country's intelligent and law enforcement resources are committed to finding those responsible. Bush said they will not differentiate between the terrorists who hijack the planes and those who harbor them. U.S. Senator Daniel Akaka was whisked off to a safe location today after the attacks on the World Trade Center and Pentagon. Akaka, his wife Millie, and other members of Congress were offered the option of evacuation by police after those attacks. Akaka's spokesman, Paul Cardiff, says the senator only agreed to be taken to a safe location after he was sure his staff was safely out of the building. Senator Akaka returned later to participate in the bipartisan conference on the steps of the Capitol. Congress will be back in session at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Air travel across the nation was paralyzed today. Here at Honolulu International Airport, the State Transportation Department put its anti-terrorist plan into action. KITV4 News reporter Daryl Huff standing by at the airport and tells us what happened there. Daryl? Thank you, Paula. Obviously, we are as far away from New York as you can get, but Hawaii has been tremendously impacted by this terrorist attack. You just have to look behind me and see this completely empty airport. Hawaii's lifeline between the islands and with the mainland have been choked off. It's obviously an inconvenience, economic problems, 
that no one begrudges because of the horror of the attack, but it is significant nonetheless. The DOT terrorist plan was in conjunction with the FAA plan to shut down air travel all across the country. It wasn't clear at first, however, how Hawaii would be involved. At first, we didn't know uh, whether we were included or whether it was just the continental U.S. Uh, there was a meeting with the FAA early this morning, which they decided that our airport would be closed as well. But Honolulu may have been the last airport in America to close down. 19 flights already on their way across the Pacific could not be turned around or allowed to continue all the way to the mainland. They would stop here. F-15 fighter jets with the Hawaii Air National Guard were scrambled as the commercial planes approached Hawaii airspace. The fighters to ensure the inbound airliners stayed on a safe course. National Guard officers did not say what its pilots were told to do if the planes veered off their required overwater approach, which avoided Hickam Air Force Base and Pearl Harbor. By 9.40 a.m., all the airliners were safely down, and the airport security brought out bomb-sniffing dogs as part of an airport-wide sweep. So we can go through and, do, and check every area to make sure that there are no bombs or any other devices that could create havoc here at the airport. Airport managers and security officials were not made available to the press, so no one could explain why the sweep for bombs on the ground didn't occur until almost six hours after the terrorists struck New York and Washington. The airport's spokesperson was just glad the chaos was avoided because the public here acted rationally. We've been very lucky today that most of the people have been made aware of what happened and we have not had a lot of people coming to the airport this morning uh, trying to get on flights. Despite the disruption, there were no complaints from local passengers, apparently realizing their inconvenience was nothing compared to the suffering of the people directly affected by the terrorist attacks. We lived uh, 25 years uh, of war in Lebanon and terrorism. And we hope uh, we'll see one day uh, peace around the world. Amen to that. In the meantime, the FAA has given the word to airports all across the country to be ready to be operating by tomorrow noon Eastern time, 6 a.m. Hawaii time. Now, there's no guarantee that anybody's going to be operating at that hour. I'm now standing with Marilyn Colley, the State Department of Transportation spokesperson. Now, Marilyn, let me start with that issue. What has to happen before uh, we get the word that we can open flights tomorrow? Well, the FAA is going to be issuing new security guidelines tonight. And any, before any airport can open for flights, uh, they will, each airport will have to be inspected and will have to meet the new criteria. And some of that, uh, the airlines were briefed a little bit about a half hour ago uh, on what they might expect to happen between now and tomorrow. Let me, let me stop you for a second because we're short on time. Tell us how things will change if they get going tomorrow in terms of security at the airport. What, what are your main points for people trying to come to the airport tomorrow? Okay, first of all, uh, no one will be allowed beyond the curb unless they have a ticket. They must be a ticketed passenger. Uh, there will be no parking along the curb. People that park in public parking lots, uh, like the parking structures at the airport, may have to go uh, vehicle inspection. Uh, they are going to be looking for knives or other sharp instruments. Uh, so do not a, a knife, no matter how small, will not be allowed through. Okay, these kinds of things could lead to delays, but you're hoping that we don't have a big crush of passengers uh, trying to get on planes tomorrow. We're hoping we encourage everyone to. Uh, confirm their flight with the airline before they come to the airport. Uh, do not come here trying to change your flight and hoping to get onto a flight. Uh, most of the airlines do not expect to begin operation uh, the overseas aircraft until around noon. Uh, Inter-island carriers are hoping to get started earlier, but again, we won't know until after 6 a.m. when the FAA gives us their guidance. Okay, I'm going to thank you very much, okay. Marilyn Colley. You've been steadfast all day giving us briefings. We appreciate it. So the highlights of this are if the airplanes are flying tomorrow, make sure you've got a plane waiting for you before you head to the airport. If you're going to come to the airport, try and avoid using the parking structure because you could be searched going in there. No one without a ticket is going in there. So make sure you communicate with passengers you're dropping off or picking up to make sure you can do it here at the curb. For now, that's all we have from the airport. Reporting live for KITV4 News, Daryl Hunt. Daryl, thank you very much. Tourist attractions were closed today across the country, both for security reasons 
and as a show of sympathy for the victims of the terrorist attacks. Disneyland in Anaheim, in Anaheim, California was closed. Another popular attraction, Knott's Berry Farm in Orange County, turned away tourists as well. Walt Disney World in Florida was evacuated, and executives closed all four Disney theme parks in all. Casinos in Las Vegas remained open, but casino owners increased security. The city of Philadelphia closed two of its most high-profile tourist attractions, the Liberty Bell and Independence Hall. Carol Huff has already told us about what happened today out at the airport front, but from Hawaii's military bases to the federal building to Ala Moana Shopping Center, the effects of today's attacks were felt just about everywhere here in Hawaii. KITV4 News reporter Cedric Kamanaka joins us live from the Honolulu Police Department with more on that. Ced, what did uh, Mayor Jeremy Harris have to say today? Well, I'll tell you what, Dan. Mayor Harris basically said there is no need to panic here. Everything is under control. And if you look around, security is heightened everywhere. And everyone seems to agree that's a good thing. As Hawaii's flag stood at half-mast in front of the state capitol, the effects of today's attack were felt all across the island. As police officers guarded City Hall, Honolulu Mayor Jeremy Harris offered help to the country's stricken East Coast and New York Mayor Rudy Giuliani. We don't know if he needs other assistance, emergency personnel, engineers, uh, but we will offer them uh, should, uh, uh, should they request. Increased security was also provided for public facilities here that were seen as possible targets. These included wastewater treatment plants like the one at Sand Island and utility companies like Hawaiian Electric. Most of it. Federal buildings all over the country were closed. Downtown Honolulu was no exception. Hawaii's military bases were placed at the highest state of alert. The line of traffic waiting to get into military installations like Pearl Harbor was indeed tremendous. But for the most part, those waiting in cars and trucks said the extra security was welcome. I think it's very good that they stepped up security posture here at Pearl Harbor to make sure that the active duty members here are safe from any other terrorist attacks. Popular tourist attractions were also affected by today's attacks. The Arizona Memorial was closed, as was Ala Moana Shopping Center. Most tourists, while disappointed, seem to understand. I came down here this morning expecting to see it open, and uh, it's closed, but you can't, um, with in respect to all the people and the loss of lives that's obviously on. I haven't heard a lot about it, but it, um, I think that it's the right thing to do. Oh, I think it's um, a great gesture that they have closed here. It certainly is a tragedy for all of America and the world, the whole world. A tragedy indeed. Now, Ala Moana Shopping Center says it will be open for business tomorrow if you're visiting a military base expect delays. Dan Paula, back to you. Cedric Kamenaka at HPD headquarters, thank you. Now at this point in time, officials are only able to estimate that thousands were killed in today's attacks. About 50,000 people work at the World Trade Center. While thousands are dead, more than 1,400 were admitted to area hospitals and thousands are still missing tonight. More than 250 firefighters are believed to be dead. The New York Fire Department says entire fire companies are missing after the buildings collapsed while they were trying to evacuate survivors. Close to 100 New York police officers are also believed dead. Another 100 people are believed to be killed or injured at the Pentagon. And the four hijacked planes were carrying 266 passengers and crew members. All are dead. United and American Airlines have set up phone lines for relatives looking for more information. Both are toll-free. United Airlines can be reached at 1-800-932-8555. And to reach American Airlines, call 1-800-245-0999. Here in Hawaii, family and friends of people at ground zero of the terror attacks watched the events in horror today on television. And they worried about their loved ones who were thousands of miles away and very often unable to communicate with them by phone or email. KITV4 News reporter Keoki Kerr joins us now with more. Keoki? Well, Paula, it's been a harrowing day for people with relatives and friends who live and work at or near the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. Nathan Lee spent much of the day watching television coverage of the terrorism attacks at his home in Kapahulu. His 23-year-old daughter, Selena, works across the street from the World Trade Center building in Lower Manhattan. It's a feeling of helplessness because there's nothing you can do. We're six hours away, it feels like I'm in another dimension, but at the same time, you're watching this on television, and it's 
It's sort of surreal. His daughter was eventually able to call and say she was all right, that she was just coming off the subway, arriving for work, when she saw the first tower on fire. And emergency crews told her and hundreds of others to evacuate. Uh, this okay? Wonderful. In Kailua, Ron Artis got a crack of dawn call from his father, Norman, who works in the Pentagon. He told him he was okay. And that was the beginning of this day, the beginning of, uh, I guess, a nightmare that won't go away for a long time. Artis says his father heard what he thought were bombs going off, but he was in a different part of the Pentagon complex from where the plane crashed, and he was unhurt. Artis received a follow-up call from his father when we were interviewing him. So everything, everything's okay there? Artis okay. began setting up for what he calls a non-stop peace concert outside Boston's North End Pizza in Kailua, a time, he says, for healing. In both cities, transplanted islanders tried to explain the enormity of the tragedy to their families. People like recording artist Scott Allen, originally from Iaea, who's been in New York for 12 years. Like I was telling my mom, it's like they blew up Diamond Head. Allen says he knows more than 100 people who work at the World Trade Center complex. This is the worst thing I've ever experienced in my life, and this is the worst experience I ever had since I left Hawaii and moved here in New York. And it's, it's just very upsetting. I'm distraught. But more than anything, I'm more concerned about my friends that were in the building, that work in the building. Relatives here say it was really difficult to reach their loved ones with the phone circuits busy or phone lines down and cell phone service patchy at best. Several people said their adult children in New York use pay phones to get in contact with them here. So, Paula, the old standby, the pay phone, which is quickly becoming obsolete, in this case, in an emergency, coming in very handy to get in touch with loved ones. Back to you. Kiyoki, thank you for that report. Now, coming up a little later, Hawaii employees of a national brokerage firm await word on the safety of their New York colleagues. If there is anything positive to find in this horrible tragedy, it is the outpouring of aloha at the Blood Bank of Hawaii today. More donors than they could handle. KITV4's Dick Augier reports the Blood Bank may need help from the military to get that blood to the mainland. Blood donors began arriving in droves early this morning at the Blood Bank of Hawaii. They packed into waiting rooms and to an overflow area set up outside the main office. Some had to wait more than three and a half hours to give blood. I came here about 8.30 this morning, so I guess about three and a half hours, four hours I waited. And I saw the, the news on CNN this morning, so I just felt bad for the people in New York. And I come every eight weeks anyway, so I just figured it's a good thing to do. It wasn't that bad a wait. You think about um, all the other suffering that's going on, so I, it's my little part to help out. As they waited, grim-faced donors watched the horrifying images on television. I turned on the TV and I saw what was going on. I was upset and hurt for the people who suffered. And when they said to give blood that they needed blood, I came straight from Waikiki. The blood bank brought in extra staff members to handle the overload. Officials say this blood will go to help the injured. What we're doing is we're part of a America's Blood Centers, which is an organization of blood banks. And so they've asked us to start developing a surplus. And so what we're doing is collecting and processing all the blood and waiting for further instruction from the mainland, from our mainland affiliate to, to find out how we can help. As the pints of blood piled up at the blood bank and no flights leaving Hawaii, officials started making contingency plans to get the blood to the mainland. Normally, we send our blood to Washington State for testing before it can be released into our, uh, to, for use. And that has been totally disrupted, and this is why I have been working with our Department of Defense as well as with SYNPAC to make sure that we have planes that are ready to take our blood to be tested. They're hoping air travel will resume tomorrow morning. If it doesn't, officials will ask the military to help deliver the life-giving cargo. Officials stress that the need for blood will last for the next several weeks, and they're asking for more donors in the coming days. The blood bank on Dillingham will be open until 7 p.m. all this week. Dick Allgaier, KITV4 News. Now, churches across Hawaii are holding memorial services right now for those killed in this morning's attack. KITV4 News reporter Tasha Gobashigawa joins us live from one of the churches to explain. Tasha? Paula, we're at Kawaii Ha'o Church across from City Hall. This is where prayer services will begin at about 7 o'clock. This is just one of about a dozen other churches who are holding 
special prayer services for those affected by the bombings today. Earlier this afternoon, more than 30 people gathered together at the Harris United Methodist Church on Vineyard for a prayer service. Messages of comfort and healing were read, as were a chance for people to come together and share their thoughts on today's tragic bombings. Songs were sung to memorialize those killed today, and as you can see there, a dedication wall was set up for people to jot down any emotions or feelings on their mind and stick it up there on the wall. We talked to a couple of people who attended the services, and here's what they had to say. Today, people are looking for a place um, that has a sense of sanctuary and a sense of gathering, um, and there's also a sense that something really powerful and deep has happened. And so to be in touch with our sacred resources, um, our traditions of our family religions, is really important today for all of us. I think that just the fact that we're meeting together and that there's a, a group of people together in prayer, mm -hmm. and in prayer for the people who did this as well as for the people that, uh, whose families are so disrupted. If you're interested in attending any prayer service tonight, you still have a chance to do that. Here are a few possibilities. At 7 o'clock, Moanalua Gardens Missionary Church and the Trinity United Methodist Church on Komomai Drive will have services. Then in about an hour from now, 7.30, two other services, one at First United Methodist on South Baratania and another at Christ United Methodist on K. Moku Street. As we mentioned earlier, there are services not just here on Oahu, but statewide, not only today, but also tomorrow and on Thursday. We have all the locations and the times for you on our website at the Hawaii Channel.com. Paula. Thank you, Tasha. The firm Morgan Stanley Dean Witter is the largest tenant in the World Trade Center in New York City. Its offices occupy 50 floors of that building. KITV4 News reporter Catherine Cruz checked in on the local offices here in Honolulu where workers waited to hear about the fate of their New York colleagues. Catherine? Well, Dan, you may recall that the previous bombing of the Trade Center was about eight years ago. The financial firm took a hit back then and learned from it. The downtown Honolulu offices of Morgan Stanley Dean Witter remain open for business today. It did, however, close early when the stock exchange shut down. Paul Liu has been with the company for 42 years and has many friends in the New York office. And I was very concerned about people on the 74th floor. That's about as high as we go. And I was very pleased to hear just about two hours ago that the whole gang on uh, the 74th floor in three departments uh, were all able to get out. And that, that was very encouraging. It's not clear how many other workers may not have been so lucky. In the 1993 blast, a bomb in the basement knocked out use of the building's elevators. Many people had to walk down several flights of stairs to safety. Today's blast brought back memories for a former Kamehameha graduate who was in that building in 1993. Well, my colleagues and I, our offices were on the 65th floor. And we had to walk down. It took us about three hours to get out. The toll of the dead and injured in today's collapse of the Twin Towers is still unknown, and it's possible some employees of the financial firm are among the casualties. Paul Liu says one lesson it learned from the 93 blast is that it had to diversify its company's operations. As a result, its customer accounts, computer services, and administrative offices are spread out from Florida to Texas. We learned from that experience that uh, this could happen again, and by gosh, it did. Now, Lou says some Morgan Stanley Dean Witter workers from Honolulu were in New York at the Trade Center for training, but they have returned safely. Catherine, thank you very much. I wanted to let you know that coming up a little later in this newscast, uh, Mary Zanax will be talking to some American Airlines pilots about their feelings about the hijacked planes today. We do at this point, however, want to take a moment to go through the timeline of today's events. It all began just before 9 o'clock Eastern Time. Many workers in the World Trade Center had just arrived when American Flight 11 crashed into one of the Twin Towers. The Boeing 767 had been hijacked shortly after it took off from Boston less than an hour earlier. About 20 minutes after the crash into the first tower, a second hijacked plane, a United flight, also from Boston, crashed into the second tower. As New York was reeling, the terrorist attack spread to our nation's capital. A third plane, hijacked after takeoff from Dulles Airport in Washington, D.C., crashed into the Pentagon. As 20,000 workers scrambled for safety, part of the Pentagon collapsed, and casualties there are expected to be in the hundreds. Back in New York, just after 10 o'clock, an hour after the first attack, the South Tower of the World Trade Center collapsed. 20 minutes later, the second tower came down. 
Evacuations began immediately after the first crash, and many were able to get out, but thousands are feared dead there, many of them police officers and firefighters who were in the towers trying to help others get out of the building. Just as the Twin Towers were falling, yet another hijacked plane, a United Airlines flight from Newark to San Francisco, crashed in western Pennsylvania. That plane was believed to be on its way to attack Camp David. Now, as we mentioned earlier, President Bush was not in Washington when the attacks happened. He was in Florida reading to some school children. The president was flown to Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana for safety. He finally arrived this evening in Washington, D.C., where he addressed the nation. The pictures of airplanes flying into buildings, fires burning, huge, huge structures collapsing, have filled us with disbelief, terrible sadness and a quiet, unyielding anger. The search is underway for those who are behind these evil acts. I've directed the full resources of our intelligence and law enforcement communities to find those responsible and to bring them to justice. The president said they will not differentiate between the terrorists who hijacked those planes and the countries who harbor them. I want to show you a different view now of the devastation in New York. This is how the aftermath of the crumbling World Trade Center looked on Doppler radar, of all things. The weather radar system designed to pick up moisture in the air, but it also easily detected the huge cloud of soot and debris caused by the fire and the collapse of those Twin Towers. Investigators piecing together today's events may get some help from cell phone calls made by doomed passengers aboard the hijacked planes. The callers said hijackers armed with knives had taken control of the jets. A man aboard the plane that hit one of the World Trade Center buildings called his father and said a flight attendant had been stabbed. A flight attendant aboard the jet that hit the other tower told emergency officials her co-workers had been stabbed. Author and commentator Barbara Olson was on the plane that crashed into the Pentagon. She called her husband to say armed hijackers had forced passengers to the rear of the jet before it crashed. Her husband is Ted Olson. He's a U.S. Solicitor General. He argued before the U.S. Supreme Court for Rice in the case Rice versus Cayetano. Seven airline flights were diverted to Hawaii following the attack, and passengers on those flights were understanding about having to land here. KITV4 News reporter Mary Zanakis talked to some of them. She joins us now from the airport. Mary? All of the passengers were quite content to be safe on the ground. They said they had no problem at all staying over a day or two. About 1,500 passengers were diverted to Honolulu. Most were en route to Los Angeles. Some passengers learned of the attack one to two hours before landing in Honolulu, while others say they knew nothing until the plane touched down. The captain notified us, and um, well, many thoughts were going through my mind, um, mainly concern for family and friends. When we landed, we realized we weren't in L.A., and they told us once we were safely on the ground what was going on. It was kind of scary, shocked, definitely, definitely shocked. When they were told of the terrorist attack, many of the passengers say it was hard to believe. Well, it was pretty incredible. The first thing that happened was the person next to me said, oh, this has got to be a joke. And then the next thing that happens is the flight attendant keeps giving all these details, which were details which were surreal, especially when you're waking up after having slept for four or five hours on a plane. The passengers we talked with said they were told that all of their accommodations would be taken care of. Right over there, I'll take care of the luggage. Various tour companies were called in to assist the visitors in getting to their hotels. They were up to the task. Not too bad. We do it every day, so just uh, back to business for us. Uh, we realize a lot of people are stressed out, so we're doing our best to accommodate them. We also talked to several airline pilots. All were of the opinion that terrorist pilots must have taken over the controls. All were adamant, saying they would plow their plane into the ground before crashing into a building. Now I also asked the pilots if the fear of being hijacked by terrorists is often in the backs of their minds. They all said no, that they didn't want to become paranoid in their job. Thank you very much. Yes, for 1,500 uh, visitors, uh, unplanned visitors, all of those extra tourists needing a place to stay. Well, hotels and airlines began working on those accommodations 
early this morning at first word that they were on their way. And Botticelli joins us now. Is there uh, anyone out there without shelter tonight? Apparently not, Dan. As Mary said, and you said, roughly 1,500 people were diverted to Oahu. Tourism officials say 2,000 passengers arrived from Asia on scheduled flights. Add to that the visitors who did not check out as expected, but we're told there are enough hotel rooms to accommodate everyone. It doesn't, it doesn't take that much, frankly. A hectic morning at the Honolulu Airport Hotel and its sister property, the nearby Best Western. Diverted or delayed passengers kept the registration clerks busy. They were prepared. You know, the staff is being real helpful. Walked up to the counter and they just said, we're extending your stay. How hard was it to find accommodations? Um, it wasn't hard. I just came, get their, got the room, and we'll be sold out tonight. General Manager Gunther Hott says first thing this morning, United Airlines reserved blocks of rooms at each hotel for diverted passengers. Some said they were directed to the hotels. Some found them on their own. All of them said they landed in Honolulu without explanation. Given the circumstances, there was no rancor. You found yourself in Honolulu, and you didn't know why. Right. That's, that's right. And you, did you know that you were not going on to Los Angeles? No, not at all. Not at all. I just landed in Honolulu, and then immigration officer told me, you know, what has been going on. That's about it. So we didn't know anything. When we were close to land in San Francisco, they told us there are a lot of congestion in the airport of San Francisco, and we are going to go to Honolulu. We didn't know anything. They should have told me something, but I, I, I understood this situation. Well, you know, if you want to go home, as soon as the airports are open, um, that's another option that you have. In Waikiki, travel agency owner Suzanne Meisenzahl accommodated 80 people who couldn't fly out this morning. The hotels have been incredibly cooperative. Um, Outriggers, Outrigger Hotels issued a statement before just about 8 o'clock this morning that they're just checking everybody in for another night, and, um, and they're giving special rates. Um, and that's pretty much been standard across the industry. Several big hotel chains offered breaks of some kind to stranded passengers, from discounted room rates to waived cancellation fees. Meisenzahl says at this point, passengers are paying the bills, but she's advising them to keep receipts. And at the Hawaii Visitors and Convention Bureau, airline, hotel, and tourism executives worked the phones to match stranded passengers with vacant rooms. By 1 p.m., with all incoming flights accounted for, they declared their mission accomplished. It seems that all the people uh, coming into Oahu will be accommodated on Oahu, and that the two flights that went into uh, Kona earlier today uh, were already uh, accommodated in two different properties there on the Big Island. Those industry officials say some airlines have paid the hotel tab for diverted or delayed passengers. Others may pay the tab, so it is a good idea to keep receipts. Dan, back to you. All right, Ann Botticelli, thank you for that report. A local spokesperson for the Federal Aviation Administration says the airport should be ready to open nationwide at 6 a.m. Hawaii time tomorrow. Tweet Coleman also says there will be talks throughout the night on whether the airlines will fly tomorrow. Actually, they're going to come to some consensus tonight in the early hours. The uh, air carriers, the FAA, and the airport. So they'll have one combined answer that will be mutually agreed with everybody. According to Coleman, that decision on whether planes will fly should be made about 3 o'clock in the morning Hawaii time. Coleman also says the FAA is considering several increased security measures. She says she was not at liberty to discuss what those measures would, measures would be, but Coleman says they will add at least another half hour to your check-in time. Now, as those airports uh, reopen, you're going to need to call your airline to find out what flight you're on, when you should be there, and those sort of things. You can find a complete listing of reservations numbers for the airlines on our website, and that's at thehawaiichannel.com. Hawaiian and Aloha Airlines say they are gearing up for resuming services tomorrow, but they warn travelers to check with their air carrier before leaving for the airport and to leave early because extra security delays can be expected. Hawaiian Air says more than 11,000 of its passengers were grounded today. The airline says it expects to accommodate those customers and new ones tomorrow. Aloha had no numbers on how many passengers could not fly today. The Hawaii chapter of the American Red Cross has activated all trained and registered volunteers and has put them on standby. There was heightened security at the Red Cross headquarters on Diamond Head Road today. Extra volunteers were brought in to answer the phone. Okay, let's see who it was. 
American Cross is actually speaking. How may I help you? We've activated our volunteers statewide to be on standby. At headquarters here, we're managing response if there should be any call out from the mainland for help, heightened security here, and being aware of the situation. In case the terrifying images are too much and you feel you need some help coping with the tragedy, here are some ways you can get crisis counseling. The Department of Health and Red Cross Family Welfare Service is offering counseling. Call 734-2101. Queens Medical Center will have staff on hand at the emergency room for people suffering from stress. And Kapi'olani Counseling Center is providing information guidelines and resources to help you talk to children about the terrorist attack. As you might imagine, it has been an agonizing wait for those wondering if their loved ones have been killed or injured in the attacks today. KITV4 News reporter Catherine Cruz talked with several Hawaii residents who have families and friends in New York. Catherine? Well, it has been an exhausting and emotional day. Many of these families have been up since 3 or 4 this morning waiting for word, and it's been a frustrating wait. For hours, Johnny Cadiz was glued to the television set in his van, but the strain of not knowing if his parents and brother were safe finally got to him. So I was worried. When I looked at the building, this does not speak to us. Clearly, uh, we can and must. Uh, he was tortured that the phones were useless. He couldn't call them, they didn't call him, and he couldn't help but think the worst. I called their number. Phone number, it doesn't work. There's something wrong. Just blocks away on Kapilani Boulevard, Nancy Sinclair had some good news. Her daughter, Summer, had just gotten off the subway on her way to work across from the World Trade Center, but she managed to get out of harm's way. All the fire trucks and ambulances and police cars were going, and she turned around to see what was going on, and the trade towers were on fire, and she saw them collapse, and the dust come up, and she just started running. Across town, a Foster Village family spent an emotional morning on the phone. Their daughter Jennifer and a niece and nephew all worked in the World Trade Center. Jennifer Ablan is a writer for Barron's. She was finally able to get through to her family to let them know she overslept and didn't make it into work on time. She said, I'm all right, but just with crying, crying, you know, she's safe, but still, she's still so bad also for the rest of the, you know. The Ablans were still waiting to hear about a niece, Monette Ablan, who worked as an accountant for Dow Jones. Uh, Dow Jones is uh, looking for her. Yeah, they, they, now they're all panicking, so you gotta call uh, Monette. But the Ablans were also relieved to learn that their nephew, Joe Cananendez, like their daughter, had overslept and was out of the building at the time of the crash. My lord, what a co coincidence, and I consider this another miracle for my daughter. You guys are in East Honolulu, some good news for Roy's Restaurant. The company's New York franchise is located across from the Trade Center. Late today, Roy Yamaguchi got word the restaurant's morning crew of about two dozen were all evacuated safely. Now, Yamaguchi is still a little worried about a second shift of workers. They were expected to arrive at work around the time the building collapsed. Now back to you, Dan. Catherine, thank you. Um, all of this relief effort is going to cost some money. Donations are being accepted for victims of today's attacks. You can make your check out to Disaster Relief Fund, Terrorist Attack, Care of the American Red Cross. The address there, 4155 Diamond Head Road, Honolulu, Hawaii, 96816. There is also a September 11th fund, and contributions for that are being accepted at branches of most local banks. The Council on American Islamic Relations is cautioning traditionally dressed Muslims in America to stay out of public areas. Here at home, Muslims are equally concerned about rising anti-Islamic sentiments. Here's KITV4's Pamela Young. Hakeem Huansafi has been on the phone all morning trying to get in touch with his brother who works a block away from the World Trade Center. His concern is not only for his brother, but the thousands of dead and wounded and the backlash that almost always results when terrorism hits American shores. We jump into conclusions, I think. Uh, in this world, there is more non-Muslim terrorists than there are Muslims. But again, we don't know. We don't know. Uh, same thing we didn't know when the Oklahoma building was bombed until later on and the person happened to be a non-Muslim. Some individuals, they will associate an act of a person or a group consisting of 10 people and take that and associate it with the quarter of the population that happened to be a Muslim, the 2 billion plus. There is fear that scenes of destruction and Palestinian celebration will inflame Americans to vent their anger on all Arabs. 
There are more than 3,000 Muslims in Hawaii, many from Asia and many non-Arab. Hakim asked that we not show the location of the Muslim Center Mosque for the safety of worshippers. Unfortunately, there is a lot of uh, misinformation out there uh, that tend to portray the Muslims in a different manner, which is opposite of what the teachings of Islam are all about. Will there be special prayers offered for uh, the victims and survivors? Indeed, uh, as Muslims, we do pray five times a day, and we have been since this morning offering prayers uh, to the Muslims and non-Muslims alike. The meaning of Islam, as you know, is two meanings. Number one, submission to God, and the second is peace. Hakim urges all Muslims to donate blood, money, and supplies for the rescue and recovery effort in New York and Washington. Pamela Young, KITV4 News. Visitors stranded in Hawaii, as well as some of those who work in the travel industry, expressed concern today about getting back on the plane. KITV4 News reporter Caroline Slider spoke to some of those people today. Caroline, how are they feeling? Paula, naturally many are feeling nervous about flying again, but there also seems to be a sense that security will be tight once airports are reopened and that it may be safe. Very nervous, very concerned. I I'm afraid. I have some fear about it. Boarding a plane may be the last thing many people want to do after watching today's devastation, but visitors on vacation here have little choice. Uh, at least we're on U.S. soil here. Um, I was in Europe earlier this summer, so I'm glad that trip's over. But uh, yeah, we're all concerned. I don't think I'll be changing my travel plans in the future, but uh, it does cause some, some anxiety about traveling. A group from England says Americans should not let terrorism change their daily lives. This man says the attack won't affect his travels, and he feels U.S. So planes are safe. It's a sad thing that it happens. It is a terrible thing, and I feel for the American people. But uh, no, it, I, I, and I don't think if you ask the majority of English people and tourists that come to your island, that it won't affect them one iota. The Pilots Union had a meeting here at the Ala Moana Hotel today, and while pilots did not want to go on camera, they do say that hijacking is something they worry about every day. One pilot says he doesn't feel safe with the current security system on the ground or in the air. He says a group of trained terrorists is no match for flight attendants and the cockpit crew. Flight attendants are also expressing concern about going back to work. To think that I fly out of New York and that I could have been on one of those planes, it makes me think twice about going back again. I talked to a couple of pilots about the difficulty of flying a plane into a building such as the World Trade Center and both agreed it would be relatively easy. One pilot said someone could have about, um, after about 10 hours in a flight simulator, could have the skills needed to do what happened today. Now back to you. Caroline, thank you very much. Dozens of churches across the state are holding special memorial services at this hour to send their prayers to those killed in the attacks. KITV4 News reporter Tasha Kabashigawa live at one church to tell us more about that. Tasha? Dan, in about 15 minutes, the church we're at here at Kauai Ha'o Church across from City Hall will begin their special service for tonight. And they actually put together a pretty extensive program uh, for tonight's special service entitled A Time of Prayer for Our Country, Our Leaders, and the People of Our Nation. This is just one church of many who are holding ceremonies right now, not on just Oahu, but on other islands as well. We just came from one earlier this afternoon at Harris United Methodist Church where they set up a memorial wall to give people a chance to grieve, give people a chance to come together and get all their thoughts out about this bombing, even though we are in Hawaii. Now, um, if you are interested in attending some services for tonight, most of them have started for the evening, but there will be services tomorrow and the next day as well. Here are a couple, couple of possibilities for you. Central Union Church will have a service at 5 in the evening, and St. Teresa's will also have services at 7 tomorrow evening. Those are just the services for Oahu. There will be other islands, other services on other islands as well, and we have those for you on our website at thehawaiichannel.com. Again, that will be tomorrow and Thursday. Special services to help memorialize and deal with the tragedy of today's bombing. So again, we're at Kawaii Ha'o Church. If you're in the area, it'll start at 7 o'clock, expected to go for about an hour. Reporting live, Dan, back to you. Tasha, thank you, and uh, we would encourage the churches to, throughout the community, uh, if you do have something planned, to let us know about it, and we will put it on our website to let others know about uh, what you have planned. Security will remain tight at military bases around the state tomorrow. There will be limited gate access to bases. Public schools located on Army installations will be closed. However, all public schools, including those on the Marine Corps installations, will be open as will Tripler Medical Center, Schofield Health Clinics, and Federal Court will be open tomorrow as well. We want to remind you that uh, Navy personnel only, essential Navy personnel, will be uh, asked to come into work tomorrow. So if you are a non-essential Navy worker, you are being asked to stay home. 
Uh, we just got word in um, of, of one of the victims who, who died um, as a result of today's attack from Hawaii. Uh, a 33-year-old woman named Christine Snyder. She is from Aikahi here on the island of Oahu, and she was aboard United Flight 93 when it uh, crashed into the building there, and we will have more for you on Christine um, and that flight tonight at 10. We fear that there may be more. Uh, these flights were headed to Los Angeles and San Francisco, which would be natural stops for people coming back to Hawaii. Uh, they have not released uh, the passenger lists as of yet, but we will comb those, of course, as soon as they are available and uh, we'll bring that information to you as it is available to us. Now, today's attack sent gasoline prices soaring in some parts of the mainland, fed by fears that oil imports will be disrupted. But Hawaii oil company Tesoro says it will freeze prices at its retail outlets throughout the weekend. Tesoro president Faye Curran is urging customers to maintain their normal purchasing patterns, not to stockpile. Uh, Chevron spokesman Albert Chi says the company has told its dealers that it does not anticipate any disruptions in its supply. She says many of Chevron's dealers are independent and they uh, set their own pricing. And, and that's something that we're seeing across the nation, though we're hearing reports of, um, of prices of gasoline going up to as much as $3.99 a gallon in some parts of the United States. So we, again, will have more for that for you tonight at 10. And we will continue to bring you local updates as necessary throughout the night. And you can always check onto our website, the Hawaii Jot hawaiichannel.com for all the latest information. Comprehensive coverage throughout the day. It will continue tonight and into tomorrow from ABC Network News. We will go back to that coverage now. We will have local updates as necessary. See you later. Aloha. Yes, I saw it. It just blew up. A big explosion. People started running. It was just chaos everywhere. People jumping out. People just kept jumping and jumping and jumping. And you could still see they were alive because they were flailing around. Center and then all of a sudden I heard rumbling and we all started running away from it. The glass like blew out and threw and me onto the sidewalk and I, I couldn't up. see for like 20 seconds. <laughs> we came from the Eddie second floor and I don't know where my peers are. I don't know. I hope to God they're okay. That's all I can say. I don't know what. We saw a shadow. It looked like a plane. Next thing we know it was boom and the floor started shaking.
it's a war. We've been uh, we've been attacked. It's, uh, it's like World War II. at it because all I can see are people I don't see a building I see people people hurt children without mothers and fathers tonight Well, celebrate a milestone.